Hello, everyone. My name is Mackenzie. I'm a product manager here at Fermion. And along with me, I have Kate. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate. I'm a software engineer at Fermion. And at Fermion, we're passionate about help helping developers build serverless functions that compile down to WebAssembly, which is a nice segue into today, today's talk, where we'll be talking about WebAssembly's role in serverless Kubernetes and how, we're believing, how we believe it's revolutionizing cloud-native computing. So to start with, it helps to level set on the definition of serverless because quite a few have floated around since it became popular back in 2014 with the um, announcement of AWS Lambda. First is serverless as SaaS. So this is a statement about management. Think about a application that was built by a single team, managed by a single team, and then other organizations or perhaps customers access that application by creating an account, a fully managed environment. The second definition is serverless as a hosted app. So think about serverless databases, serverless functions, serverless containers. The common thread across all of those is you have a resource that you are defining, implementing business logic, and at the end you hand it over to another team, another company to run it on infrastructure that they own and manage, and you typically pay a little bit of a premium for that. And then the third category, which is what we'll be talking about today, is serverless as a software concept. So it's a design pattern where you do not use a software server. A software server is a long running process that's listening for requests and handling them. It will handle hundreds, thousands, millions in its lifetime before it's eventually restarted. A serverless application doesn't listen. It actually spins up on request, processes that request, and then spins back down, freeing up the resources in between requests. So it's fairly short lived and ephemeral. So this is the third definition that we will be using today when we mention the term serverless. There are a few problems with this first wave of serverless that all stem from the packaging mechanism typically being used as a container or a micro VM. Serverless originally came up because we wanted to have really great startup performance. So this is event driven code that's listening to our requests, processing and spinning back down. We wanted to have an uncomplicated developer experience. Ideally, this is portable and helps us cut down on cost because we're only using the resources when we actually need them. So let's dive into these problems a little bit more. First with a startup. So if we look at AWS Lambda, it can take up to 500 milliseconds when cold or 200 milliseconds if you're paying a premium to have it pre-warmed to start up and start executing. Sometimes that delay is longer than the actual pro like time it takes to execute the function itself. And the workarounds to solving this problem are typically complex and expensive. Another issue is that, again, well, in the case of Lambda, you're using a micro VM, but in other solutions, you might have a container. And with the container, you have the entire snapshot of the file system, other dependencies, libraries you might, be, might not be using that you're pulling in from other layers in your container. Um, and it leads to a bloated unit that you're deploying and managing. Not to mention, you rarely run these types of applications on their own. The ephemeral code needs somewhere to store its state. Um, it typically has networking requirements. And as an application developer, you're having to define those, handle the connection strings. It becomes difficult to manage all of those in a secure way, not to mention local testing becomes more complicated. Portability becomes compromised as well. Third point, containers are expensive. So we talked about all these things that are in our container besides our business logic. So those are consuming resources. In addition to that, um, it becomes really complicated to understand exactly how much CPU and memory you need to assign to that container. So now we have a bloated unit and it becomes difficult to predict the scale, like how many containers do we need to use during a peak in traffic. And a really interesting paper that came out by Google studied all of their Kubernetes users who had more than three nodes in their Kubernetes cluster. And they came up with four signals to think about cost. We'll focus on the first three primarily today because those are application developer concerns and platform engineer concerns. Workload right sizing, so the ability to actually use the resources you've requested for your container. Demand-based downscaling, so scaling back the number of nodes you need and scaling back the number of pods you need when traffic is no longer at its peak. Cluster bin packing, so the ability to accurately right size or accurately fill up your node with apps that are going to use those resources. And then the fourth, which we won't talk about as much, 
discount coverage. This is more of a budget owner concern, but if you don't have high availability requirements using an evictable VM like Spot, or if you're able to predict your long-term traffic, reserved instances are a good way to cut down on cost. And so what this paper did is take all of these Kubernetes users and classify them into five different groups. From at risk, who typically did the worst in terms of cost management to elite performers and asked, what are our elite performers doing right? Um, and unsurprisingly, elite performers were really good at, get, at assigning the right amount of CPU and memory to their containers. They also were able to, because of that, downscale. So because they understood the requirements of those containers, it became a lot easier to predict predict how well they would serve the traffic and pull that back in between peak hours. They also did a much better job of, right si of uh, bin packing, so putting those containers on the host and making sure they're using all the VM resources that were available to them. That being said, it's not always that easy to predict traffic and scaling is, a def is definitely a trade-off between cost and availability and it's worth taking a second look and saying, is there another unit we can use to scale that would make these problems a little bit easier to solve for? And enter WebAssembly. Um, so Mackenzie just mentioned a lot of issues that we have with serverless, and a big one being the startup time of our current units of serverless, namely containers and micro VMs. And so we're going to talk about how WebAssembly potentially provides a way for serverless to achieve its aims. And so to start off, what is WebAssembly? So WebAssembly is, can be thought of as a portable compilation target. So to break that down, I can write my code in my favorite language of choice and then compile it to WebAssembly. So this is just a .wasm file. And then I can run that anywhere I can put a WebAssembly runtime. So that's x64, that's ARM, that's Windows, that's Linux. So you really have this portable universal bytecode. And to look at that in more detail of those benefits, we talked about the portability. So you can run it anywhere. So there's no more cross builds like you have with containers. Um, you also have these small package sizes. So your ExpressJS app might be a 200 and four, to 400 megabyte um, container, but for a WebAssembly component, that's about two megabytes. So that's amazing when it comes also to being able to transport this as an OCI artifact, it's way smaller. Your pull rates are a lot faster. Um, and beyond that, it is executed in um, linear memory in a sandbox by a WebAssembly runtime. So you have a really tight security posture. And beyond that, WebAssembly has something called capability-based security. So what that means is a WebAssembly component only has access to resources that has been explicitly granted access to. So no access to files, databases, outward, uh, outbound HTTP requests, nothing unless explicitly granted access to by the WebAssembly runtime. So it has this really strong sandbox posture. And then what we like the most um, for our discussion of serverless is the startup time. So we talked about how micro VMs take about 200 milliseconds to start. We have to pre-warm instances because of that, incurring cloud costs. With WebAssembly, your um, uh, WebAssembly component can start in less than a millisecond. And one of the other things we talked about with serverless is how do we have the developer experience we've been looking for um, with it so that we don't have vendor lock-in, so that we um, don't have to handle all these dependencies so that we can get access to these external resources in a really declarative way. And so the open source project that Mackenzie and I work on is called SPIN. And what it aims to do is create um, a really, uh, a, a very easy expressive experience to running event-driven serverless WebAssembly applications. And so you can see here, it really is broken down into three simple commands. So you do a spin new, and that's where you go through your decision of what is my favorite language. So you choose your language of choice and you have your application templated up for you. And then with spin build, now you have that .wasm file, and with spin, uh, with spin run, or sorry, spin up, it's going to run your WebAssembly um, application. And that's because spin not only is a CLI and a developer tool, but it's also a WebAssembly runtime itself. So within the spin uh, binary is, a web, is WASM time, which is a WebAssembly runtime that was created by the Bytecode Alliance. So if you've heard of the Bytecode Alliance, it's the organization that's working on a lot of the developments and the specification around WebAssembly and its latest release of WASI 0.2, which brings forth the component model. So those are um, words that you might hear within the WebAssembly ecosystem. You might hear 
a WebAssembly application, a WebAssembly module, a WebAssembly component. Um, those are all ways you can think of a WebAssembly application in its different phases of um, evolution of the specification. And just to call out, because we are at Open Source Summit, um, we have like over 75 contributors, lots of stars. Um, and the reason I'm calling that out is because throughout this talk, if you hear something and you're excited about it or you feel like something's missing, uh, please put up an issue or contribute because um, we're really trying to expand the WebAssembly ecosystem for serverless. And uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and show a quick demo of Spin before we move any farther. So I just have a recording um, and then a little later we'll do hands-on that's a little bit more involved. Um, so here's those commands I was just talking about. We have our spin new and here we're gonna choose Python and then we choose our application name. So we're at Open Source Summit, so we're saying hello to ourselves. Um, and then you can give a description, that's optional. You could just choose to not do that. And then with the HTTP path, that's where we're deciding what endpoint of the um, service that we are put, posting this um, WebAssembly application on, do we want to trigger it with? So this is an HTTP trigger. So if we hit, we're just saying the endpoint itself, no matter the path, we're gonna trigger the WebAssembly application. We'll talk a little bit about other ways to spin, uh, to trigger spin applications later. And then now we just um, go into the directory of our scaffolded application, and you can see that we've created a simple, um, Hello World application that receives an HTTP request and returns an HTTP response. And you can do whatever you want with this um, templated application to expand it. We're doing something very simple here, which is just updating our response to be relevant to where we are today. Um, and then after that, we do our spin build. And then we can run our WebAssembly application with spin up. And you can even see there what the output of that spin build was that app.wasm. And now we're just going to um, ping our application that's sitting on port 3000 and we got a response. So that's just a quick look at the developer experience. Um, and we'll dive into a more fully functional application in a little bit. Um, but to go beyond what we could have done there. So we didn't see a very exciting application necessarily, um, but a big part of serverless applications that why, while them themselves, they themselves are ephemeral, so they, can, they have to be stateless because we're gonna spin them up on demand and bring them down, they require unstateful resources. So Spin also provides a way for you to easily, through SDKs, connect to those external resources, and beyond that, uh, swap them in and out. So I may use um, SQLite for a key value store, or I might swap in Redis for a key value store, and you never have to rebuild your application. Um, you just uh, you can you just keep um, you just pass in a new configuration for what those host level resources are, and it automatically will reconnect to those. Um, and so to mention a few of the other things, I said key value store, you can also connect to SQLite databases. Um, you can actually run inferencing requests from your spin applications using LLMs. Um, and all of this is once again bundled into that CLI. And to mention some of the other things that trigger our applications, we said HTTP. Your spin application could also be triggered by a Redis message, by an SQS message. You could directly invoke it. This is useful. We're going to talk in a bit about spin and Kubernetes. And this is useful for sidecars, for containers. Um, you can also subscribe to an MQTT, MQTT topic. That's a lot of T's. Um, and have a message from that uh, trigger your spin application. And then finally, um, you can create your own triggers. So Spin has a plugin system. You literally type spin plugin and spin plugin install the plugin you want. And you can create your own trigger and add it to spin as a plugin. So MQTT and SQS were added to spin that way. And I'll pass it off to Mackenzie. Awesome. So Kate showed us how we can build a spin application, test it locally, connect it to resources. And now let's say we want to do something a bit more interesting. We've realized the benefits of working with Spin and WebAssembly, and we have a larger workload, a batch job, perhaps cross-origin resource sharing, and we're gonna need more than one Spin application, and we're gonna need to connect it to cloud resources. This is where we're really excited to talk about SpinCube. It's an open source project that allows platform engineers to deploy Spin applications onto your Kubernetes cluster as custom resources. This will run in nearly any modern Kubernetes environment, so manage clouds like AKS, EKS, GKE, any star K you want to run it on, and then locally as well, K3D, uh, KubeCon EU this year, we had a Raspberry Pi cluster set up, and we had a demo going there, so 
it really brings the power of WebAssembly to any Kubernetes environment, nearly any Kubernetes environment you can think of. So how do we actually realize this? It makes sense to start with the operator. This is a combination of four different projects, operator, container D, shim, spin, runtime class manager, and a spin cube plugin built by many different companies, Fermion, Liquid Reply, SUSE, Microsoft, and the con contributions of many others, all coming together with this shared goal of being able to empower platform engineers to run their spin applications on Kubernetes without a lot of overhead, over overhead on setting up all the necessary dependencies along the way. So the spin operator uses the Kubernetes opera operator model to take an image, the bindings to make secrets, and deploy those applications onto your cluster as re regular Kubernetes objects. In order to do that, we need a little bit of help. And that's where the container D shim spin comes in. And it allows, it's built on top of something called RunWASI that allows us to run these spin applications alongside our containers on our host nodes. And you may be thinking, that's great, now I have to install a shim and manage that. Um, that's where Runtime Class Manager comes in, for, formerly known as KWASM. And it allows you to install the shim, manage its lifecycle, security patches, all within the Kubernetes API. And lastly, we wanted to preserve that really great developer experience, which is where the SpinCube plugin comes to play. So you can continue to do your spin new, spin build for local testing. And when you're ready to deploy that application, uh, you can use the Cube plugin to scaffold that into a Kubernetes resource, um, provide that to a CI CD pipeline, or use Cube Control to apply to deploy it directly to your cluster. And this is just a visual representation of all these projects working together in concert to give you a spin app on your cluster. The top level is mostly a developer concern of actually building your application, scaffolding it, and handing it over to wherever you're going to deploy it, uh, where the spin operator watches for new custom resource definitions, and then we'll deploy those on to the appropriate nodes, which are all set up thanks to Runtime Class Manager, who have uh, added the shim appropriately. And a great um, case study to look at as to why you might want to take take on this challenge of rewriting some of your applications into spin applications. Um, a common misconception is you have to rewrite everything, and that's not necessarily gonna be the case. Finding a workload that resonates with those problem statement statements we were sharing earlier is a great place to start. And that's exactly what the Zeiss group did. They had a order processing workload where they have a batch job that receives the orders, adds a little bit of metadata, and then stores those orders in object storage. And they took a look at SpinCube and thought this might be an interesting way to modernize these workloads that were previously running on, um, they were running on Azure Functions on Kubernetes. They tried Azure Container Apps. Um, Kai Walter, who is the lead architect at Zeiss, has a great Dev2 article that goes into more detail of his performance testing that I highly recommend you check out. Um, but they added SpinCube to that mix. And they realized they could have just as great performance running with Spin Apps and actually save 60% on their costs because they took advantage of that portability promise and moved all of those workloads over to ARM VMs and cut down their costs drastically, going back to that fourth golden signal from our Kubernetes paper earlier. So what does this look like in practice? We have the projects and we have this kind of high, um, you know, this 5,000 foot goal of saving costs. Um, in day to day, we really believe this looks like the separation of concerns done right. This is a really tricky problem to solve because it involves people. And while the solution is not perfect, I think SpinCube, this community is working towards a really elegant solution um, by allowing application developers to continue to use the programming languages that they know and love in their workflow, uh, use plugins to connect to resources that they need, um, take advantage of the secure by default um, security model that WebAssembly gives, setting them up for success, all while preserving the platform engineering experience that platform engineers know and love uh, with all of their Kubernetes native resources. So we're gonna build on the commands we had earlier, uh, skipping a little bit further down the line. So we have an application we've built, and in that process of building it, we're actually generating a OCI artifact that we can push to any OCI compatible registry. SpinCube scaffold is gonna take that and convert it into a into Kubernetes YAML, and then we can keep control apply or hand it into whatever CI/CD pipeline we would like. 
So this takes a look at a slightly more sophisticated application that you might write uh, with spin. Here we have some basic cache logic where we've opened a key value store. We are checking if a pair exists, and if so, returning the value, and if not, logging that it's not found. And as an application developer, you don't really have to care what's backing the key value store. You just open the connection, you call in, and you examine the contents of the store. This is where the magic happens. So this is an application manifest for your spin application where you are specifying you need access to a key value store. You're specifying yeah, you actually need access to an inferencing model that's hosted on remote compute. Um, and you can also see the allowed outbound host, so the outbound connectivity you need to make. And this is the contract that you're going to hand over as an application developer to your platform engineer to say, OK, put this, connect this to the necessary resources. We don't necessarily care what they are, but you know what is needed in order for this application to run successfully. And this is just a visual um, example of that. So the application manifest that we were showing on the previous slide, getting scaffold into a Kubernetes resource um, that's ready for deployment onto your cluster. All right. And so looking at that experience, uh, what happens after we deploy that to our cluster? So um, this gets into kind of the operator model. So we've applied our custom resource, and the spin operator sees that. And what it does in response is it creates a deployment of pods. And you can specify in your spin app custom resource how many replicas you want. And so it'll create a deployment with that many replicas and put a service in front of it. And you may be thinking deployment, I think pods, I think containers. Um, so the deployment in those pod specs, it points to an OCI image just as you would a container. But as we heard with spin registry push, that OCI image has a WebAssembly um, component in it as an artifact, not a container. Um, but it's still using the OCI specification. And in that pod spec, we specify the runtime class. And that's where we're saying spin is the runtime class. And that's how container D knows to use the spin shim. And so then when the container runs, we're now using the spin shim, and it's ready to spin up WebAssembly modules on request. And to look at that custom resource uh, more in depth, because the great thing about custom resources is that you can extend them with all these different fields. Um, so within the spec of the spin app custom resource, you'll see we have that OCI image, um, those replicas to declaratively say how many replicas you want in your deployment. Um, and then you also can add the things that you know and love about Kubernetes. So annotations, if you want to annotate each of those pods. Um, you can add resource limits, just as you would. So if you want to right-size your workloads, like uh, Mackenzie was talking about at the beginning. You can also add liveness and readiness probes. So if in your spin app you add endpoints that can be used as liveness and readiness probes, that translates right into Kubernetes. And along the lines of resource limits, you can use autoscalers as well. Um, that can scale up um, as you're getting close to those limits. So you can use the horizontal pod autoscaler, or you can use CADA. And um, private container registries still work as well. And um, you can also set volume outs. So we talked about capability-based security with SPIN um, and WebAssembly in general. And so say you grant access to files to your WebAssembly module, you can volume mount them and make sure that those files are accessible. And SPIN has a concept of variables. It's a way of dynamically updating um, variables that are passed to your application. And so that you can change those. You could update your SPIN app custom resource. And then whenever it gets that variable, it'll get the new value. So you can have dynamic variables for your application. And then finally, the one that is we're going to dig into more with the demo is runtime config. And this is where um, we have our platform engineer make decisions about what those resources are behind our spin application. And you can update this. So for starters, you might use a libsql database for your SQLite database. But maybe later on, I don't want to use my DB, and I instead want to use Mackenzie's DB. I just reapply the custom resource, and now we're hooked into the new one. So let's get to the demo that we've been talking about. Um, so our demo is going to be a sentiment analysis application. So this gives a little snapshot of it, but what it does essentially is you're going to pass in a sentence, and it'll tell you if that sentence is positive, negative, or neutral. There's no sentiment really there to discern. Um, and to look at the architecture behind it, this spin application is going to have two WebAssembly components in it. Uh, so not just one. You can actually have n many different components, each of a different language, all within the same application. So one of them is going to be the front end that we see here. 
Um, and to give a shout out, Caleb Shep on our team put this together, and it's a beautiful um, interface. And um, the other one is going to be our basically our back end and our API, and that's going to do all the heavy lifting. lifting. So what it's going to do is it'll get that sentence, um, and then it'll first check a cache, so our key value store, and it'll see, has anyone else asked about this before? And if so, it'll return the sentiment that was cached. And if not, it's going to send an inferencing request, and we're going to use remote GPUs instead of using, because this is a MacBook, um, instead of using my CPU, which will take forever. Uh, and then that'll return the response. And if you are inspired and want to try this, we have a bunch of samples up in Spin Up Hub, and this is one of them. So you could go to um, that link and try this out. And we're going to do it in TypeScript, but I believe there's other examples in Python and maybe Rust as well. Great. Um, so I've cloned the repo upstream that we have for this. I might make this a little bigger. Can you see the top of that? Yeah, OK. We'll just do, make sure. Okay. Um, so I've uh, cloned the repo, and um, we're going to go ahead and open an editor. We're going to do the TypeScript one. And this is our spin application. So let's start with our spin manifest that Mackenzie was saying. This is kind of where we define the source of truth for our application and say what the needs of our application is and the structure of it. So here we have two components. Our first one is that we mentioned is our UI. So it's called UI. And um, this is actually using a pre-built component. So we have a static file server that you can pull into any of your applications with a spin add. And that's going to serve up our front end. Um, and those assets are up a directory. And those have all the, the front end that Caleb built for us. And then um, we our second component is our sentiment analysis component. And that's basically what's doing all the work. And so we can see that it has access to two resources, our key value store for our cache and an AI model to do those inferencing requests with. And just a note, by default, if you don't um, use any runtime configuration for your uh, key value store, Spin will use a built-in SQLite database. And then for your um, inferencing, it'll expect that your model is downloaded to dot dot .spin AI models, and there's our Llama 2 chat model. Once again, we're not going to use this one because I don't want everyone waiting for it. But if you were to decide to be patient, that would be your option. And let's go ahead and look at our application. So starting with where we enter. So we get an HTTP request, and we land here. So we have an incoming HTTP request, and we um, the, the, Java, the TypeScript um, SDK has a router you can use to route certain requests to certain functions. And so here we're saying, um, if you hit the API sentiment analysis endpoint, we're going to perform sentiment analysis. So let's look at that function. What it does is it'll get the body of the request, get the sentence that we asked about. It'll check the key value store and see that that default string matches what we saw on our spin.toml. So we can actually have multiple key value stores connected, and each of them could be from different sources. Uh, if we get a hit, we return it. If we don't, we proceed. And we're going to use the LLM SDK to do an inferencing request on the Llama 2 chat model. And then we're going to take that result, and if the model's not great, we'll just make sure it has positive, negative, or neutral in the answer, and that'll be what we say the sentiment is. So that's our application. Um, let's go ahead and run it. So um, our first step is our spin build. And um, now we have our WebAssembly application has been created. Um, and the next step would be to do a spin up. Once again, I don't want to use uh, my local CPU. So what we're going to do is we're going to use runtime config. So let's look at that. So instead of, um, I'm basically here saying for the LLM compute resource, use a cloud that I've an application I've deployed to Fermi on cloud. So we have a plugin called Cloud GPU. And what it basically does is it will deploy a spin application, just like this one, to Fermi on cloud, where we have GPUs hosted. And that will act as a proxy to run inferencing requests on our GPU nodes in the cloud. So that's the application that I've created, and then we have an auth token um, to access it. So I will now do a spin up. Great, so I've done a spin up and I passed that runtime config file. Let's go see our UI. So here's our sentiment analysis app. Does anyone have anything that they would like to know if it's positive, negative, or neutral? 
Great. I will. I will. Um, I will decide one. Um, it was hailing today. Oh, okay. That is a fact. I was very surprised by that. It was hailing today. And that's neutral. Interesting. I, I agree. Um, yeah, that can be exciting. Um, <laughs> that took probably about a second, and that's because we sent off that request. Uh, let's now hit the cache um, and see how that's a little faster. So that was instant. Um, caches are great. Side note. Um, Great, and so we just saw spin that developer experience, but the other part of what we're talking about today um, at ContainerCon is how do I take that and put it on Kubernetes, my favorite containerized container orchestrator. Um, so I actually have um, a, I'm connected to an AKS cluster, and you can see I have uh, one control plane node and two user nodes. And if I, um, Let's see how we've already provisioned, I just skipped over all this, um, these Azure control plane services to the end where we have, um, where we've provisioned SpinCube on our cluster. And so we have KWASM, which is that other name for our runtime class manager. And you'll see that three jobs completed. We had three nodes in our cluster. So that basically installed the shim on all three nodes of our cluster. And then we have our spin operator, which is running and waiting for our spin app custom resources. So let's go ahead and apply this to our cluster. So our next step in our development life cycle was a spin registry push. So we'll do a spin registry push. Um, and I have a public um, image that I've, um, on GitHub container registry, I made this image public. Um, and I'm just gonna overwrite what I have there and push up the application we built. And so this is taking our spin application, put it, putting it together as an OCI artifact and pushing it up to a container registry of your choice. So we pushed it up and our next task is um, spin queue. And we'll scaffold now our spin app custom resource. And let's get our registry endpoint. So that is the spin app that we've scaffolded using spin queue. That's not quite enough for us. We went through that whole section of how you can, spit, uh, can um, extend your spin app custom resource, and we have resources that we need to connect our application to. So we're going to need to add that runtime config section to our spin app. So I have that already prepared for us. Let's take a look at that. Let's see if this is big enough. Um, I think that's okay. So this part looks like exactly what we saw but now we have the runtime config section with those two parts. One being our remote, um, our, our ability to send remote inferencing requests. So here's that Fermion Cloud uh, proxy application for us. Same as what we had previously. And I've just um, set that token in a Kubernetes secret because you know, me just showing you your, the secret wasn't great anyways. And then we also are connecting to a key value store. And we obviously, here we're using one that we deployed to the cluster, which we actually haven't done yet. So let's go ahead and do that. So I have a Redis service here, simple deployment of Redis with a service sitting in front of it that we're then connecting to in our runtime config. So now our Redis pods are running or singular pod is running. And the only other thing to mention here is, um, I've also mounted CA certs into my pod to make sure we can use, uh, do TCP requests. And now we're ready to apply it. Great, um, that was very quick. So our application is running. Let's go ahead and port forward and go back to our browser. Where are you? While you're pulling that up, if I wanted to make my inferencing requests on my AKS cluster, because I have my own models, is that something I could do with SpinCube? Yeah, you definitely could. It would be the same process that we had locally. So you could just volume mount the model from your host um, so that you can use the one directly on your host. So say you do have a GPU enabled nodes in your cluster, you can use those locally too. Um, 
we're back to our app. Um, I'm gonna, since we had so much emphasis on what to choose last time, I'm gonna choose this one. Um, I love Open Source Summit. A strong positive, if you ask me. Yeah, if that's negative, we're a little, okay, great. It works, maybe. <laughs> uh, so I love Open Source Summit. That was positive. That sent requests um, to our cloud GPUs. And then once again, we can hit the cache and make it faster. And that concludes the demo. All right. Thank you, Kate, for showing us SpinCube in action. Well, if you are inspired and you want to get involved, here are a few ways to get started. Uh, the center QR code is going to take you to our SpinCube docs. It'll also have helpful links to our social profiles. Uh, we have monthly community meetings, which definitely recommend folks attend if they're interested. There is a Slack in the CNCF. We have a Slack channel in the CNCF organization on Slack, all dedicated to SpinCube. And then also our GitHub as well is at SpinCube. There's a roadmap there, and you can check in on the individual projects and see what's up. Um, it may be open an issue or two if you have something you'd like to see. All right. Well, thank you so much for attending our talk. I think we have like a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Yeah, back there in the white shirt. Is there any specific browser requirements, in like uh, uh, older than certain version of browser you cannot use, SpinCube or something like that? Um, so I think that question maybe stems from the fact that the technology we were talking about in this whole presentation is called WebAssembly. Um, but the thing about WebAssembly is you no longer have to run it in the browser. So you can run it natively, uh, just like I was in our demonstration. I was running it just natively on my laptop. I didn't need to um, emulate a browser or anything. I was using a WebAssembly runtime built into Spin to execute it locally on my machine. And so while WebAssembly originated in the browser, now with WASI, you, and since 2019, you can run it outside the browser. Oh, OK, so you're saying for the developer experience, if I don't want to have to set anything up on my machine, can I go run this in the browser? Thanks, everyone. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. Can you debug it? Can you like set a breakpoint and check for your code and check if it works? Yeah, that's a great question because that gets at the point that the WebAssembly ecosystem is definitely still evolving. So um, breakpoint debugging of WebAssembly components is not where we want it to be. Um, so while you can breakpoint your native code, so while we were developing that in TypeScript, I could use my normal TypeScript debuggers for that it's really hard to debug WebAssembly at the given time. So if I have that .wasm file and I want a breakpoint execution of that, that's not quite where we want it yet. What programming language do you typically use for Spring? I would say Rust has the biggest ecosystem support. Um, so, and I, I'm a Rust developer, so that's what I personally prefer. Um, but you can use, uh, like over for Spin, we have over 12 different languages we have templates for. Uh, and there's good support for TypeScript, Python, um, TypeScript or JavaScript, Python, and uh, Go as well. Yeah, and so you might be getting at that. It's an interpreted language. How does that work? Um, so for interpreted languages, oftentimes the interpreter is also compiled to WASM. So the, uh, the binaries are a little bigger. Yeah. So to support, so for SpinCube, um, you just deploy it into the cluster or into you know, onto a subset of your nodes once, and then like those different, those actual spin applications can deploy, those deployments exist in their own namespace. So if I want to add this to an existing application, I could do that without, I could just install in a cluster once, and then any of the app teams that 
we're going to use it would just have to create that deployment? Is that what that would look like from a platform yeah. standpoint? So you can run these alongside your containers and as long as SpinCube sets that runtime class so that um, container D knows to use this shim. And so just like your containers are running, you can then just add SpinCube to it. You don't need to set, create certain node pools for it or anything. Um, and you can also have spin as like sidecars to your normal application and vice versa. You can have container sidecars in SpinCube as well. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more um, in the hat in the front. Yeah, um, so I can push my, my files to any uh, container registry that I might use locally? Yes, yeah. It's totally OCI compliant. Uh, does it have any support for proxy VASM? Like, if we want to combine it with Envoy proxies, do you have uh, or la do some extensions like customization in our applications? Do you all does do you also provide that feature? I I don't think I fully follow. Is Proxy Wasm a specific uh, uh, project? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. uh, I think maybe take, we can take it offline. But uh, it's like an extension where you write the same VASM, but for a proxy, and okay. you basically chain the filter. But I wanted to know if you are also doing something in that line. I, um, I think service chaining and filtering is something you could do with SPIN. So you can compose components that do various levels of filtering along a request. So I bet you could do something similar with SPIN, but I'm not as familiar with proxy VASM, so I'd love to chat about it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>